financial advisor walk into a bar? Oh, and then what happens? Well, the question then came around and is, um, is gifting equity to key employees or family members a good idea? Ah, I see this a lot. It's a bit, it's a bit of an Oprah Winfrey situation. It's you get equity, you get equity, you get equity, you get equity. <laughs> Uh, I see that a lot, especially in startups. People give away equity, um, I think, instead of paying people because they're, they've got, you know, they've got 100% business and it's a, a bit cheaper than, than paying people. And then in more mature businesses, you see it where you want to, you know, reward a key employee or whatever. Yep. Um, you, you give them some equity instead of giving them some cash. And I've got some real concerns about it. I think people misunderstand it. And, uh, and uh, I think they're pretty, they're often too quick to give it away without really realising what they're getting into is that yeah, something I think, but is that yeah i agree from that point of view you know are people is it if the business is being starved of cash but they're trying to retain key people is it very short sided where they go yeah actually i'll just if i if i give them some some equity um that might retain them for longer so they've got a bit of skin in the game and a bit more of an upside which again is a fantastic way to incentivize people but my, my concern always with that when people do it too quickly is not being clear about around the sort of how you pull it together, so from a shareholder agreement, but also what happens afterwards if that person that may be very good to start with doesn't perhaps turn out to be who you yeah, thought they might good. have been yeah. along the way because, you know, they think that their, their um, a skill set is greater than what it may be as the business grows. Yes, that's right. They might be good for the for in the state, like in the um, early product development stage, or they might be good at you know um, um, securing new clients for a while. But then when the business matures, suddenly they're they're dead weight, so to speak, or they just their skills aren't appropriate anymore, and and they may by then own twenty, thirty percent of the business. And I think a lot of the business owners don't really realise what giving someone equity means for them in practice. Um, first of all, they might not quite understand what equity is. And then, and, and what you know, and what what rights it gives rise to. For example, um, you know, if you're a minority shareholder in a business, so if you own less than half the shares, you've got a right to some documents, um, and you've got a right to you know management decisions and voting and that sort of stuff. Yep. And so, if you're you know used to running the business yourself 100 as a hundred percent owner, you might think, oh well, I'm going to make a key employee a ten percent owner. But then suddenly you you're in partnership with someone, which maybe you're not quite ready to do yeah you need to share you have to share that's right and if you've been especially i I I started this business on my own and i want to make all the decisions and i don't like sharing yeah well one thing that often happens is they, they say well um you know there might be a big investment that the business needs you might need to put money in to buy a new bit of machinery or computer system or hunt down a big client or whatever Yep. And, uh, and the, the main owner might fund that and then the minor owner might not want to put money in or the minor owner might say, well, I don't want to, I don't want to reinvest the profits. I want the profits to be paid out to the team because that will affect my dividends or whatever it is. And suddenly you've got these tensions that you really didn't have before when the person was an employee. Um, and so you is can that, create is tension. That, is that, is that really where you start to see a lot of the complexity that people don't, well, one, they may not have sought advice prior to sort of agreeing to some of those situations, but they don't always think of the multiple implications of once you've issued capital to a third party, what does that actually mean? And especially yeah. the minor shareholders, do, can, they, can they just become a real thorn on the side for the larger shareholders? Absolutely they can, yeah, absolutely they can. Suddenly they say, oh, well, I want to see the licence agreement with your other entity that owns the intellectual property or... You know, I want to be involved in that, you know, that negotiation or, or whatever. And, and they're entitled to those things. You know, they're an owner of the business. They're not, yep. you know, they're not just a key employee anymore. They're an owner. And I think sometimes the intention is to reward a key employee by, say, let's say, say we want them to improve the profitability of the business. So if they've got a stake in, in, in equity, they're going to try and um, improve profit, which makes sense. Um, but really, that's more of a bonus. They could just be paid, you know, a percentage of the um, the net profit of the business, or they could be paid a bonus based on re- reaching certain KPIs or whatever, which achieves the same 
um, outcome, but without them becoming an, an owner of the business and, and you know, have all these additional rights, which is fine if that's the plan. You know, if the plan is to go into partnership with someone else where they're an owner too, no problem. But I think you've got to yeah, think through what, what does ownership actually mean? And I think it means a lot of things that perhaps weren't intended when people are giving away um, equity to an employee or giving away equity sometimes to a family member. The, the skin in the game thing I hear all the time, I want so-and-so to have skin in the game. Um, but I also see people um, then end up in disputes with those people or, or end up really ruining what was otherwise a great relationship, particularly a family member, right? You might have, yep. have had a great relationship with your brother and now suddenly uh, equity. I mean, I've got four brothers and I can tell you, if I, I love them all, but if I went into business with them, we'd be killing each other in five minutes. <laughs> That'd be the end of our family, happy be family the, relationship. Well, best, be, the best draft of the shareholders agreement, but you can imagine which way that goes. <laughs> Yeah, Not that's right. Way. I mean, I would have drafted it. Towards the one way, wouldn't it? You know, right, yeah, on, boys. Right. Hang on, this Alex Martin guy's got got the, the 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 he's the chairman, and he's got the the, the final vote on everything. I don't Correct. remember it's seeing amazing that. that how he's drafted that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but is that? But it, but then if we look at that from that point of view, so if we turn around and say that we're trying to, um, you know, there's an incentive for, for employees. Is sure. there a way that an agreement can be put in place that means that they are given, you know, quasi equity or phantom yeah. equity? I mean, yeah. I, I, people refer to it in both, in that they obtain a percentage of the business, but don't actually own it. So, so it's yeah. just seen as, you know, that you might gift them ten percent phantom equity. So therefore, it's 10% of the profit, but they don't actually own the shares. It's just a formula to incentivize people. Yes. Or can you do it on the basis that it might be, you know, 10% phantom to start with, but there is a potential opportunity in, in the years ahead or months ahead where that could be a converted into real equity yes. through a yeah. capital payment. Yeah. But there's an agreed formula. So is there a range yeah. of different options for people to start to look at that sort of stuff? Yeah, all of that's possible. I mean, the general rule in sort of contract law is that, that if you can sort of, if you can agree it, you know, if you can dream it, you can document it, right? So it's anything's possible. Um, yep. You can certainly have, you know, the phantom menace uh, share, uh, shareholder, uh, sorry, what is it, the phantom menace shareholder agreement or or, um, or, or, or bonus arrangement or whatever. Um, really what that is, is just it's just a bonus. It's just the way the bonus is calculated is by yes. reference to profit or, or whatever. So I think I wouldn't, I mean, you can call them a phantom shareholder agreement, but I'd just call it a bonus agreement because it's just a bonus. It can go as part of an employment agreement or, or separate or whatever, and it can be calculated by reference to the profit of the business, the net profit or the EBITDA or whatever you want to use. Yep. Um, to pay someone a bonus that really has the same effect um, as a dividend. In fact, it gives them more rights in some ways and they might be happier with it because it's not up, often dividends are up to the discretion of the board and the, the main owner might um, still control the board. So um, a, a, a phantom shareholder agreement um, bonus arrangement would allow the person to get paid regardless of whether a dividend was declared. So that's all possible. And then you can certainly do... Um, uh, you know, start off with this kind of bonus arrangement, and it can go on to being a you know have an option to purchase um, purchase shares and so on. Um, it, it, all of that's possible, and, and I think they're all they're all good ideas at different stages in a business's kind of life cycle. If you've got a key employee, by all means reward them. By all means link that to profitability, um, but I think you just want to be not giving them equity too early. Yeah, because you kind of hear about it, and so you know, really, if we t look at the the topic of today is is gifting equity to key employees or family members a good idea? And I think sometimes that can also be a very um, sort of flippant way to kind of support people. It's like, oh, I'll just do yeah. that. Whereas you get the other side, people are also saying, well, there's no way I would, would, would give any equity to anyone. And if they were to have equity, they need to pay some capital for yep. it. So it yep. can also then, um, not allow the business to grow because the working capital is not available for that. Yep. So it's yep. there's always a real challenge with the way you know how you look to to incentivize you know positive and and, and um, strong employees. Mm. It just it's always mm. an interesting one when when people because we, if we look at what's going on today, you know, in 2021, the retention of staff is going to be an enormous issue across the board. 
I think yeah, e sure. everywhere because people are, you know, they're looking at opportunities and they're saying, well, you know, where's the long term? I don't want to just work for a salary. If I'm working in this business and providing support and my skill set, sure, you pay me accordingly, but where, where's a little bit of the upside? That's yeah. There, which is always a balance. I understand that, but I think it can, it can be difficult if you're paying someone a salary and then let's say you pay them 10% of the profit of the business as well. Um, I query, you know, I mean, it obviously depends on the business and the personality of the people involved. But, you know, if you're already on a salary, really, then you, you, even if you do a bad job, you're going to get your salary. Yep. And if there's no profit of the business, you, you're still going to get your salary, right? And if there is profit, then you're going to, it's only a relatively small portion that's going to come to you. So you think, is that going to make all the difference? Maybe it is. Maybe it'll change the way they see themselves. Um, but I think, you, you know, you either, I'd go hard or I'd go home. I'd say, look, you either get a percentage of the business, get equity, and you get a percentage of the business, and you get nothing if the business makes nothing, uh, and that's your entire incentive, or you get a salary and maybe a KPI-type bonus or whatever based on yeah. your own performance. Because um, I can't so see too many people, if the business makes a loss, you turn around and say to them, well, you would have got a 10% bonus if we made a profit, but we've made a loss this year, so can you... Can you tip in 10% of that loss to increase our working capital again? Yeah, or, or can you yeah, forego your salary for this year? Because that's what I've done as the business owner. You know what I yeah. mean? I mean, if yeah. you're the owner of the business, you're not getting any money while the business is making a loss. And so if you really want to change someone's thinking, then that's the thinking you want. You want, well, hang on. Uh, I mean, they, and I think there's a huge benefit in thinking like a business owner. But I think if you just give someone 10%, a 10% ownership stake in the business, I'm not sure it really achieves making them think like a business owner. Because, you know, when your mortgage is on the line, right, when it's your, your money you've taken out of your mortgage to invest in the business, and, and you know, you, if you don't win that new client or whatever it is, but make that sale, then you don't get paid next week. That's a different perspective, right? I mean, I know it, you know it. Um, yeah. and, and our clients who are all business owners know it, you know, and so when they're considering giving away equity, you know, to an employee or a family member, I think they really want to think carefully about what that means uh, and does it achieve what they, they want. Because um, often it doesn't. I think it's, it's a, you know, it's a... To me, it's, it's almost a, like a short-term yeah. hit. It's like a sugar hit to yeah. the employee sometimes. And yeah. like, unless the business is progressing towards, a, you know, a, a, a listing environment where there's a lot more capital and they want to broaden the shareholder base. But mm. on, on some of the smaller businesses, I think that's always a challenge. I mean, sometimes it ends up being, I think it's just, you better to pay them a bit more or provide them with a car or yeah. give them some other form of, um, you know, incentive that's agreed to, you know, yeah. overseas holiday when we can, um, yeah. you, you know, things like that, 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 that may be beneficial rather than, you know, the default back to, well, they've got skin in the game because they've got ownership. Well, yeah. Is that really the right incentive to have for people? Yeah, that's right. And do they have control over, you know, how much the, the net profit is? It may be, it depends what their role is. But if they're a salesperson, I mean, they can maybe make sales and, and control the revenue. But, you know, you as a business owner might decide to, um, to, to have a major expense that year, which, you know, might mop up all of the revenue, you, you know, that, and then they might resent you for it when before Correct. if they just had a KPI to increase the revenue and you paid them the, the, for that, then they might be happier. So it's really a, a horses for courses thing um, in terms of giving equity and a, and a think ahead thing, you know. I, I've certainly seen, I'm not sure that everyone, like business owners know, if they're thinking about giving equity to an employee or a family member, do they know what rights that, Gives them, you know, does it gives them a right to um, to vote? You know, it gives them a right to appoint and disappoint directors, or at least a right to vote in relation to that. Which you know, someone might say, "Well, hang on, I don't fancy that." And maybe you give equity to three or four people, and then suddenly they're suddenly a voting in a block or whatever, which which might cause you problems. And, and if your shareholder agreement doesn't start, have the right provisions in it, then maybe they outvote you. Which See, would clearly be very in your brother's important. agreement, you'd make sure that the voting rights of three other brothers could not be <laughs> combined to vote against the, you know. Yeah, you have to have a legal practicing certificate to vote on the board. Correct. It's, just a, it's in the fine print. They didn't read it, it just carefully. just cuts them all out, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. so, then, so, so then if we look at that, so what happens, and so say there is a situation does arise that someone has, you know, issued the... the um, you know, some equity. So, so again, yeah. we come back to, is gifting equity to key employees and family members a good idea? Because yeah. the other side of that is, it say that has occurred, but you've also got to look at the other side of the equation that says, 
Um, and I'm going to refer to these as the four Ds. We've got a dispute, death, a disability, or a divorce. So if we oh, issue... they're fun Ds, aren't they? Yeah, they are. They're brutal. But at the same time, what happens with each of those when something occurs? You know, if there is a dispute and they're a minor shareholder because you've gifted them that, what 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 are the rules that fit around that? And for people to understand, so they may have yeah. given it, but not looked on the other side about what do we do to either claw back those shares and it's through a combination of those or do I need to purchase them back from the individual and how have you yeah. valued, valued it? it, it can I say on that, we see that all the time. So, so minor shareholders have um, special rights, special protections under the corporation's law. And, and the, the, the law says you're not allowed to oppress that shareholder, which can be a whole bunch of things. Um, anytime you act in, a, in, in your own interests, not in the interests of the shareholders as a whole, then you might um, be seen as oppressing them. And so they can actually sue you and say, you know, you've done the wrong thing and, and potentially get the court ordered relief, get you to force you to do things like pay them dividends yep. um, if you've acted in a way that's improper. And because and it's this amorphous claim, you know, it becomes an issue where because there's uncertainty around what it means and doesn't mean, you know, you end up in a dispute when otherwise you wouldn't. So by making them a, 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 a minority shareholder, you've actually given them additional ammunition and additional uncertainty um, in the event of a dispute. Whereas if they're an employee, you've got much more, much stronger rights as the 100% business owner. Yep. Um, so in the first D's case, certainly giving someone equity makes life a lot harder for you. Well, it's making sure that you've got your backstop that occurs that if there is a dispute, we've agreed to this. So therefore, yep. they would need to agree to, you know, a dispute resolution methodology yeah before they execute on the shareholding that's how i would kind of look at it from from, from that point of view because yeah, that would well, always be my real concern for a lot of people is you know it's good when it's good yeah and it's always good when it's good but it's and then dave it comes bad. along with his three d's and it's the well, worst, yeah, four d's you know. and it's the well, worst but then, yeah but this is and so that's where we come and kind of come into the next yeah. one is what happens with debt so yeah. if you've got a key employee who, for whatever reason, just dies, does, yeah. does, does that individual's estate then have the same entitlements to that shareholding that that individual did? They do, yeah. That Their, their, their interest, because it's an ownership interest, right? So they own property and you can't, you know, the property doesn't revert back to the company when the person dies. If they own property, it goes to their estate. So it goes yep. to their husband, wife, children, whatever, um, who... Uh, who inherit that property and you can't, you know, you can't alienate, you can't take that property back without their agreement. So, I mean, it might make sense for them to sell it back and maybe they will, but maybe they won't. Maybe they'll have a view about, you know, getting rid of you and taking over themselves, you know. It, yeah, but that then goes back to the valuation. Agreement. Yeah, yeah. So that goes to the shareholder agreement. So that's the other point about having a, uh, having a, uh, giving someone equity. You, you, if you're going to give equity, then you want to have a shareholder agreement in place so you know what, what they can and can't do, what the protections are and so on. See, and, and that should have again. a valuation. It's these, it's these bloody lawyers and all they want to do is write up agreements and just rip more money <laughs> out of people. You go, well, it was, a, bit of, it was a, a couple of grand for the advice about equity and now it's another couple of grand for the shareholder <laughs> agreement. Before you know it, you're, you're, into, you're into Alex Martin for 10 grand. Yeah. But again, that, that highlights the issue though, doesn't yeah. it? Because it's, not, it's just not a single piece of the puzzle. We need to yeah. paint out the full picture. And so therefore there may be multiple sections that need to occur for this to, and which then goes back to your much longer term planning of the business around what is it that you, where do you see it going to? Do you see it coming out to the wider market? Do you see, um, you know, how are there ways that you can incentivize your, your employees in different ways as opposed to putting a shareholder agreement? And so it's being aware of what some of those options could be. Yeah, and nothing wrong if, if, if being, giving them equity and having a good shareholder agreement in place, you know, works for your business goals, then that's great. You know, I'm certainly yeah. not standing in the way. It's really just a question of, is that appropriate for what you need? Are you just giving away equity without kind of thinking it through? Yep. Um, so what's the third D? How many The third D's? one was disability. So say it's a key ah, employee. Yeah, okay. Now, yeah, okay. they may have an employment agreement yeah. that, that, you know, would deal with some of these issues, but... If they become, and that the, the disability may occur through an illness, and therefore, yeah. I mean, the issue they may then revert to death. But at the same time, they're a key employee, 
do, how do we handle that going forward? Because if they're the disability may be in a position that they can't work, yeah, but that could be multiple years. But they're yeah. still a shareholder. But is there? Yeah. Does that again come back to the shareholders' agreement that says, well, if a person is, or do you need to tie it back into their employment agreement? in the way yeah. that it's drafted, that if they're not yeah. available to work for a certain amount of time, there's a capacity to claw back their shareholding yeah. or there's an automatic ability to repurchase the stuff back. That's why I was saying earlier, the important thing to understand what ownership means. So if they own shares, then that's a separate thing to their employment, completely separate. So you know, if they're an employee and they get injured and they're not able to work, then they've got leave and so on and work cover and all of that. And that would yep. just be dealt with in the normal way. And if they couldn't, in the long term, couldn't perform the work, then they couldn't work there anymore, right? So that'd be all fine if they were an employee and they, maybe they had a bonus arrangement, they wouldn't be getting their bonus and that'd be that. But if they're an equity owner, then if they're disabled, then they're still and not able to work, they're still an owner and they're still entitled to their dividends as the same as they would be. And, and that goes on forever until yep. such time as they sell it or, or make a decision, you know, and if they're unable to make their own decisions, then whoever, you know, whoever's got their attorney or whatever is the person who makes the decisions for them about that. So um, it'd be, it is possible to have um, a contractual right to reacquire shares and so on in the event of someone being injured and all of that. So all of that's possible, but it's certainly much simpler if you're, you know, if you're, if you're really talking about someone's labour, then you're talking about their employment agreement. Whereas yep. you're talking about their ownership. And often I think because, you know, I mean, I'm an owner of my business and I also work in it and, you know, it's easy to get muddled. But, you know, working in a business and owning a business are two separate things. You can, you can own a business and not work a day in it. That's no problem. We all do when we buy shares in the share market, yep. um, just in, in a, on a small scale. So you've got to think about it in those terms, I think, which really helps. So then the fourth one is divorce. Because, you know, uh, matrimonial relationships never break down. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, they do. Yeah. But then, then it is... Is the situation that um, someone that has been married and is now going through a divorce that that asset of that shareholding would fall into them, the, the the class of matrimonial assets, and would then the, the family court have a capacity to obtain information or from the company because it's private versus public to go yes. back with an agreed valuation? I mean, is that a real yeah. dilemma? That, that yep, you, you don't even need me here, Dave. You've just nailed it. That's absolutely right. That's exactly that's exactly how it works. So that, that share would become part of the matrimonial assets, which would be, you know, um, in dispute or would be dealt with by the family court. And the family court can make, first of all, would need evidence as to what it's worth. And so that might mean you get all the valuation, you get all the, the, the private financials of the company and they all get, um, um, hauled before the court and can get, you know, there can be expert evidence arguing about what it's worth, especially if it's very valuable. And that's common in, in matrimonial asset division cases. They're often about, um, often the main point of contention is what's the value of the company or the, because, you know, businesses are, are difficult to value and you can have lots of different views about what they're worth. So often that's where the, the fight is. So yeah, certainly if you're- you get a, one party saying, oh no, it's worth X, and one party saying, oh, no, 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 let's talk down the value because it's not Absolutely. really worth and, and, and they might really even be fiddling valuable. the books. Yeah, you know, that's, that's yeah. the real dilemma, isn't it? On that Absolutely. Point. And in fact, what we often see is you see that there's a disjoint, a genuine dis misunderstanding of the value of the business because one party might be at home with the kids, the other party might be in the business, and the party at home with the kids might be living a pretty good life, drive a nice car, everything's good, and the person working in the business might see that the business actually has a lot of debt and a lot of you know problems and you know the, there's the, we're about to lose a major client or customer or whatever, and uh, and so the person at home with the kids might be thinking, well, life's pretty good. This business must be pretty valuable. Mm. And the person at, at the office every day is going, well, this business is worth nothing. You know, looking it's, a bit it's shaky. The, it's all looking a bit shaky, and they might not be fully honest with their partner about all of that. And so there might be a genuine misunderstanding without anyone being vindictive, but a misunderstanding about what the business is worth. And suddenly you, like if that's happening to your 10% shareholder, you know, you're the 90% shareholder who started the business and might be saying, oh, now I'm getting dragged into all of this. This is all very bad. I don't want but to be part that, of this. But, but does that occur? Like, have you seen those circumstances where there is a, the majority shareholder is sitting there as, you know, let's say they're the founder, and they yeah. have, you know, provided equity to either a family member or, or, or an employee. Again, the gifting of equity to, to, to the key employees or family members 
is that a good idea? Is that mm. the real challenge, especially with divorce? You know, how do we how do we address that? Because all of a sudden, as you say, the the majority shareholder can get dragged into this, especially if the business is is a private business. But it's actually worth quite a lot. You know, even though you can mm. say oh, it's only ten percent, but if the business turns over, let's say it's you know three hundred million dollars. Yeah. It's actually worth a lot of money. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. We just did a litigation over a childcare business, and our uh, client owned twelve percent, twelve point five percent, and and that settled for one point five million. Right. Yeah. So you know that was that's a pretty that's a pretty juicy settlement, and that was real over what the shares were worth. Um, so they can certainly be worth a lot. And not only do we see that kind of stuff, Dave, but we, we get subpoenaed. Like I've been subpoenaed to produce records. Um, that I have relating to um, the you know company finances. Now, obviously, if it's there's a, a privilege that applies to lawyers and so on, but uh, people get subpoenaed. So the, you, as the main owner, if there was a family dispute, you, as the main owner of the business, might be subpoenaed to produce all of the records, um, uh, the financial records of the business, so that they can establish the value of the ten percent share. And you'd have to hand over all of those. You wouldn't be able to defend that. So, so you're really in a position. So you're saying in that situation, I'm the eighty percent shareholder, and I've got two other shareholders at a 10% apiece, and one of them is getting divorced, yes. there, there would be, if we were subpoenaed, there would be an yes. obligation for us to provide the fina full financials of the business over a period of time to support the um, valuation process for the divorce settlement. Exactly. That's exactly right, yeah. Wow. So and that's something that probably you don't really think... But you can actually subpoena any third party who has documents that are relevant to a proceeding. So you can subpoena a bank, you know, an insurance company. I mean, they get subpoenaed all the time. But you could certainly subpoena, you know, you, you, you know, you, you, people often like in, in divorce, they, they often subpoena the rest of the family, you know, because it might be that, you know, someone's getting divorced and they might be in business with their brother and the brother might get subpoenaed. So you have someone sort of, you know, someone's sister-in-law might be subpoenaing them <laughs> or you know brother-in-law might be you know whatever it is so, so it can be can pretty around, like is there any way around it or it's just that's just one of the risks you need to accept if which again comes back to our question is gifting equity to key employees and family yeah. members a good idea now yes. clearly I'm amongst those four d's of, of dispute death disability or divorce to me from the, the discussion we're having divorce is a nightmare for you it can be, yeah. So you would have to hand over. There's no defence to it. If you're a third party and you've got documents that are relevant, you'd have to hand them over. Now, they're only allowed to be used in court for the purpose for which they were given. They can't be used for other purposes. And I think, you know, you'd be in contempt of court if you did that. So I wouldn't be too worried about confidentiality or whatever. But it's, you know, a hassle and you have to do it. And, you know, you get minimum compensation for it. And that's just something you have to live with. Um, yeah, I think the lesson is that, that when you're giving equity to somebody, you're giving them, you know, you're taking on a major kind of issue. It's a major decision. And so you want to think through, you know, is that is the equity that I'm giving, am I getting, the, is, is the company and is the business getting the value out of that partnership with that person, you know? And if yep. you're really just trying to reward them with a bit of extra dough, then there's other ways to do that. But if, you, you know, you're taking on a major business partner, they have their own customers, they, you know, are doubling the size of your business or whatever then you know, maybe giving them equity is a great idea and maybe if you get subpoenaed, you can live with that. Um, but you really want to be getting the kind of value equation right when you're giving out equity. Um, uh, when maybe, I mean, I often think that, that, that our, my clients who are giving equity should just be giving cash because, you know, if it's they can clean, afford it, it, it's clean. Yeah, that's right. Just say, and here's some money. Is, Thank you. Is, that, is that really where we sort of sit on that, on that sort of scenario? If we're looking to, to gift the idea of, of giving equity across or even it may be in a form of compensation or that they're purchasing the equity you're still exposing things so it comes back to the assessment that says what's the long-term objective of of offering equity to a third party and do i get the the commensurate return by allowing that to occur going forward is that exactly. how you would kind of put it together exactly yeah what am i getting out of this and is that and is that is that is it worth it, and given all of the other factors that come along with it, which I think sometimes people uh, are not really aware of or haven't really thought through? I think there is certainly less of that equity uh, option given unless it's a, it's a business that is in a rapid growth phase, but they may then take on a private equity for funding or 
or structure it in such a way that they go to a wider market for investors to come in and the, and the major shareholder sells down to a percentage for that reason and set it yeah. up, set, set their corporate structure up in such a way that that doesn't occur. I think as a yeah. private you know, business that may not be looking at that particular path, I'm with you, it goes back to the decision around what's the best way for me to, you know, incentivize some key employees. You know what, maybe it's just cleaner and easier just to write a, a bigger check. Yeah, if you've or got... Or give them got other cash. incentives along the way. Yeah, yeah, I even even sometimes giving them incentives like a holiday. I mean, we've had a client who gave holidays away to key salespeople who loved it and they, they ranted about what a great business they were and the holidays in the scheme of things weren't worth all that much, but they were sort of a bit more thoughtful and a bit more... You know, fun that, and they they took their partners on the holiday, so the partners thought their you know their their partner's boss was pretty good, and all that sort of stuff. It you know yep. it, it really, you know, and then there was a bit of bonding on the holidays and all that sort of stuff. So there was all these other benefits, which might be you know a more um, a more effective way of of incentivising or encouraging you know the right culture in your, in your company. Um, yeah. One thing I wanted to ask you you is, is do you what about succession? What about handing over to you know your son or daughter or your a nephew or niece or whatever, um, you know, in terms of gifting equity to family members, if you're planning on handing over a business to a, uh, you know, you're the next in line, if you like, in the family, does that put a different kind of spin on how you'd see, because you're not just going to give them cash, you really want them to take ownership, you know? Yeah, there's a real balance with that. And I suppose part of that becomes the, the discussion around, um, you know, if we're taking it from the founder, first generation down to second, Yes. You know, where is the business going? Are any of the family members working inside or outside of the business? How do we equalize that approach? Um, yes. What is the transition? Do you deal with it with a, you know, let's traditional model of husband and wife, they start and own the business equally and then the children are involved and some are not. It comes back to, do they want to keep the business in the family? Yeah. So therefore, is there a way that it might be, you know, they may transition part of the ownership, 25% to each of the children. Now, some of them may or may not be working in the business if there's four kids. Yeah. How do we deal with that? But then the parent needs to make sure that they still have an appropriate income stream to support their lifestyle. Yes. But that, that really becomes, that's not a simple discussion. That's very much around, well, what would we like to see happen with the business and how big is the business and has the business been able to provide a cash flow to then build assets away from the business so therefore yes. an exit from the business may not be such a dramatic it may be very easy for them just to literally close the doors and not not actually pass it on to anyone of any value because that it's just the way it is others it's like no this is a phenomenal business that is has um, continuity in place and kids want to re remain involved in the business and it just becomes a natural progression but the cascading of ownership may not yeah. occur until the original shareholders are either deceased or yeah. they make a very um, measured approach in how they cascade that ownership yeah. down to give the next generation the management and the control of the wider group but the parent who is from one to two yeah. has an adequate income stream to support their lifestyle yeah. but they still want to be involved so it, it, it there's no there is no perfect um or out of the box solution it yeah. really comes back to how do they want to deal with it because you, you, there'll always be circumstances that occur that some of the kids maybe want to be involved or the, the, the children's spouses may, may actually be very active in the business. So the immediate family is actually not the one in the business, it's an in-law. And that's a good or bad thing. But then there also could be some other family members who are equally involved. They may sit on the advisory board of the business if it's a large enough size, but they work in a completely different industry and, and, and either running their own business or work in something else or they may be in the arts or they may be in whatever yeah. it is yeah but they're still part of it but they're not active in it yeah yeah well, we see they sometimes they go and do something else and then they come back to the nest 10 years yeah. later you know with yeah. a whole bunch of skills that that you know and, and different experiences and so on and maybe they come back with their mba and dad says 
I don't care about your fancy NBA, <laughs> you know. <Pretty> much. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit you of that. Get your hands or, dirty. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's right. Um, but they actually might be a very good, capable manager. Um, so, okay, so that's, a, I mean, handing over to a family member for the purpose of succession is a whole different discussion. That's probably... a very big discussion yeah. and, and there is yeah. a range of different paths that can be, um, you know, kind of taken and spoken about in, in that area. Yeah. And one of them might be that no immediate family member, you know, they might work there whilst they're at school and, stu and studying, but post yeah. that event, that there may be a requirement that they have to go away and work somewhere else for a minimum of five years just to get some right. additional experience. Yeah. Or they may yeah. be, they may agree to, you know, get them overseas to work with a different business that then yeah. gives them those broader skills that they may not have ever been able to achieve in Australia. So yeah, yeah there's, there's a whole range of um, options around that. But I still think some of the challenges that we've spoken about, dispute, death, disability and divorce, yeah equally yeah. applies to immediate family members as it does even just an employee or other wider family members. Yeah. Those yeah. challenges are still going to be there. Like that, yeah. that can still happen. So therefore, what's my broader family succession strategy and how do I want to pass assets down and across to family yeah. members? And so discussions and, and, you know, as we keep saying to people, the more you talk about it, the clearer it starts to become, but it also starts to help you develop the purpose of what the business is for. Yes. So it's not just yeah. about, you know, growing wealth, that's one aspect, but certain businesses have done exceptionally well that part of that engagement then becomes, well, what do we do as a business to support our philanthropic interests? How can we yeah. provide to give back to the community that's been very supportive to our business? And so that's yes. when you really start to get into a very different um, you know, succession around, you know, do they hold equity or do they hold it in a different structure? And, yes. you know, they could, you know, there could yeah. be two brothers that own it. So the uncle's there, but now one member's gone, but that uncle's still yeah. there, but are the two sides of their family? How do we, how do we kind yes. of manage that? Well, there's some so, big, there's some, some well-known business families in, in Victoria that fall into that category, I think. Yeah, where absolutely. One, someone's passed away. Now their family still runs it. That's right. But that's a really a bigger discussion than just say giving equity to an employee or some family member in a kind of a flippant way. It's a, it's a. But I think in terms of if you're looking at succession, it's a much uh, broader planning thing to be to to do. Yes. Um, than just, yes. Yeah, yeah. But again, I think part of the if we talk about you know the the gifting of equity to key employees or family members is also about the strategy around your staff retention. How do you keep your team together and how do you attract strong people? So, yep. so, that's, so that's a very different approach. But that's the same. I think that, that approach is still going to be with um, family members. Just because you're a family member doesn't mean that you should get an automatic right to work in the business. Yeah, like, sure. To me, you still need to go and prove that you're a capable individual and that you're the right person and you're bringing back to the business if you've been away or if you're making an application to join the business, you, there's still got to be a role there that's appropriate for you and not because you happen to have the same surname. Yeah, yeah, well, that's right. And you've got to earn the respect of your colleagues, which you're not going to do if you can't yep. do that. Yep. Um, I've seen it certainly very tough, I think, for, for, for young people, especially when they're very young, coming through if they've got their, you know, the son or daughter of the founder. And it's perceived that they have an easy ride, although they may actually have a tougher ride than anyone else. Yeah, I agree. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't fancy it. Um, so I think, mate, is the lesson in all of this, you just run a business yourself, then you sell it, and then you give the money to your kids and you don't worry about it? <laughs> well, the, 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 you know, that, that makes it very simple. But again, it comes yeah. back to what's the purpose of the business and what, what, yeah. you, what you know, do you, want, do you want to grow the business to have um, a, a business that functions without you there? Or is yes. there a sense of your own identity? Or, or is there a real passion around it? I mean, there yes. are so many different paths that you can take when we start to look at some of these things. But I think sometimes for some people it is, I'll just give them some equity to keep them incentivized. And I think through yes. the discussion, there are a range of options available. And I do think yeah. it's important for people to understand what those options can be. And the default is not always equity for someone to keep them involved. There's yeah, different great. ways to, to, to incentivize them along the way. And if you've started the business and grown it and built it, it's always hard. You don't want to just give it away. 
<laughs> yeah, well, that's true. I mean, my experience has been, and, and of, of most of my clients has been that good team members, family or not family, employees or, or, or whatever, they if if they're committed, they're committed, <laughs> uh, and that you know, giving them five percent equity or a, a bonus, you know, I mean, that's nice and that's great, maybe, and maybe you want to do that, but I don't think it turns someone who's not committed into someone who is committed. Yep. And as I sort of mentioned before. If you're gonna, if you want to turn them into a kind of a business owner with business owner mentality, then it needs to be a bit more severe than just, well, you get your salary plus five percent. You know, you want to say, well, you know, then suddenly you got to be have it it all on the line if you like, if yep. you want, if you want to change their thinking to just to, to to a business owner's kind of thinking. And then maybe you don't want to change their thinking to a business owner because if they're a business owner, maybe they'll nick off and start their own business. <laughs> well, possibly, yeah. but but what yeah. do they say in the in the research that um, money's like number four or five on the list of, of requirements. Yeah. You know, just because you offer someone more money doesn't make them, you know, enjoy what they're doing. There's a whole lot range yeah. of other issues that, and I yeah. think even over this COVID period in the last 12 or 18 months, that's even highlighted that more so that I think people are really assessing, you know, what, what's important to them when they're working inside a business. Yeah. What does that yeah. mean to them? Is it is it... The money or is it well actually i prefer a little bit more flexibility and ability to be able to work in different environments or to spend yeah. time with young families and you know again there's 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 every there's all sorts of different ways that we can always look at supporting people this is just one aspect that i think um people really need to consider their options when they're thinking about it yeah. So it's should they get financial advice. advice before they give, if they're thinking, I'm going to give 10% to my key salesman or to my brother or whatever, should they get financial advice before they do that? I don't think it's just financial advice. I think there is a, there's a, you know, there's three advisors involved in this. One is financial advice. The other is an accountant because of the yes. tax structuring at, at the situation. And I also think it's a lawyer. So I think from a collaborative perspective, all three need to be aligned in that yes. it's just not one discipline because it will have implications across all of them. So it is very much um, having that discussion and bringing the multiple parties together to understand, again, what's our end objective? What's the yeah. purpose of doing this? That will then help drive the direction where it could be. That's, uh, I think, is the best solution and not, not just as a saying it's a, either a financial advisor or a lawyer. I think it's both yeah. with the accountant as well. Yeah, there certainly is different. I'm, structure. Yeah, I'm no expert on the accounting side of it, but I know there's lots of ways you can structure it in the accounting. So depending, you know, it might be the employees paying the tax or it might be that you're paying the tax or whatever. There's lots. I know they had these, um, in, you know, employment. Well, there's lots of different ways of, of, of yeah, of, exactly, of, 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 of and then, the, the, but the tax rules around employment share plans changed and made them less attractive and so on. Um, I think at my old firm years ago, I had some, some shares, which uh, I think I had to give away when I, when I left the firm, which uh, uh, was, you know, didn't make any difference because the shares weren't worth anything anyway. Yeah, well, there you go. <laughs> Not without me there, they weren't. Well, you know, that's where the real premium was when you were there. I mean, that's, once you walked out the door, the premium was just removed. That's you know? right. That's no, right. One, no one wants to sort of own those shares after you've gone. Yeah. Mm. So, so is there anything you want to kind of wrap up with on, on this particular topic? Yeah, so, so giving equity to employees or to family members, all I'd say really is that's – that's a, an A-OK -okay thing to do, absolutely, if you sort of think it through and that ultimately what you want to do is go into partnership. That's an ownership. You want to give ownership stake to someone for their long-term involvement in the business as, as a partner with you, not as a employee, not as, you know, the, the uncle that you want to look after, but as a partner with you in the long run. If that's the plan, then go ahead, um, but just think it through. Um, if that's not the plan, then I think often the answer is just give them some sort of bonus if you want to incentivise them you know, a KPI or whatever that they can that they can influence themselves. You know, something that's that's right that that, that if they're a salesman, you know, a sales target or whatever it is, um, so that, that 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 might be more appropriate. And I certainly I often talk people into giving their employees bonuses instead of giving them equity. And yep. uh, if you can afford to do that, I would do that because I think in the long run that's better in most cases. Yep. I mean, my wrap up on this is um, 
I think it's fantastic that a business owner is thinking around um, mm -hmm. ways to incentivize in key employees, but equity is not the only option. And so bring yeah. the ideas to the table and seek advice from multiple parties to determine what the best outcome is. Determine, de being based upon what is the purpose of what you're trying to achieve yeah. for the long term. So it's just part of the mix and part of the puzzle that you're putting together it's not, it, it's not going to be the only piece and the key piece. It's a piece of the puzzle. So that's, that's very deep. Thank you, Alex. <laughs> we like to be deep. But look, yeah. you know, again, I think if, you know, there is, it's a really interesting topic. Um, yeah. And I think if people want to reach out and, uh, you know, continue on this to be more specific to their circumstances, I think it's important that they kind of reach out to, to, um, to either of us. So... I'm sure we will um, have our contact details within the show notes and we'll pick it up from there. So, Alex, once again, an absolute pleasure. Lots of banter, lots of bullshit, and we like that. <laughs> Nothing like having Thanks, Dave. I appreciate it. I think most of the bullshit came from my side as usual. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> All right, we'll see you at the next one. See you at the next one. Thanks, Alex.